Merry Christmas. I'm sure this is a great, wonderful day for you as you woke up excited that this is the day the Lord made, that this is the day that the incarnation of Christ and you maybe you went down and went down the, the tree and opened up your presents. Or maybe you had a Christmas breakfast or for some of you, maybe you went to church today. For other of you, maybe you guys went and um, had a Christmas Eve service like I did at my church. But today is Christmas. There's no exciting time, the time of Christmas. Uh, for some of you, you may be watch, going to watch a Christmas carol or watch the Tiffany movie. Um, and, and this is a sort of fun, exciting time. Uh, friends of maybe get together, friends and family and have a feast together. And it's a day that we should rejoice because this is a day that Jesus Christ is born, God incarnate. And as we go through all these festivities, let us turn to our final day in our devotion of Good News and Great Joy by John Piper. We're going to look at day 25, and it is titled, The Three Christmas Presents. The Three Christmas Presents. And we're going to look at uh, two sections from 1 John, 1 John 2, 1 through 2, and then 1 John 3, 7 and 8. And it says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the very beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. What a great passage. Of I, uh, First of all, I just love, he calls them my little children as john writes his churches he sees them as his children they loves and nourishes them he sees himself as a father figure but then describing what jesus christ is doing he is our advocate he is our propitiation uh, that uh, he is our advocate between us and the father and and he came to defeat uh the works of satan which is sin a great passage and so let's see what John Piper has to say. Part of this remarkable situation with me. If the Son of God came to help you stop sinning, to destroy the works of the devil, and if he had also came to die so that when you do sin, this propitiation and removal of God's wrath, then what does this imply for your living your life? Great question. What does what is the implication for how we live? Three things. They are wonderful to have, and I give them a briefly as Christmas presents. Gift one: a clear purpose for living. The first implication is that you have a clear purpose for living. Negatively, it is simply this. Don't sin. Don't do what dishonors God. I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. 1 John 2, 1. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. If you ask, can you give us the positively instead of the negatively? And the answer is yes. It's all summed up in 1 John 3.23. It's a great summary of John's whole letter requires. Notice a singular commandment. And this is the, his commandment. That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And to love one another just as he has commanded us. These two things are so clearly connected for John. They call them one commandment. Believe 
Jesus and love others. That is your purpose. That is the sum of the Christian life. Trust Jesus and loving people the way Jesus and his apostle taught us to love. Trust Jesus, love people. There's the first gift, a purpose for living. The second gift, the hope that our failures will be forgiven. The second implication of the twofold truth that Christ came to destroy our sinning and to forgive our sin is this. We make progress in overcoming our sins when we have hope that our failures will be forgiven. If you don't have a hope that God will forgive your failures, when you start fighting sin, you give up. Many of you are pondering some changes in the new year because you have fallen into sinful patterns and you want out. You want some new partners, patterns of eating, new patterns for entertaining, new patterns of giving, new patterns of relating to your spouse, new patterns of our family devotions, new patterns of sleeping and exercise, a new pattern of courage and witness. But you are sh struggling, wondering whether it is any use. Well, here's your second Christmas present. Christ not only came to destroy the works of the devil or sinning, he also came to be an advocate for us because of his experience, because of experiences of failure in our fight. So I plead with you, let the fact that the Pharaoh would not have the last word give you hope to fight. But be aware, if you turn the grace of God into license and say, well, I can fail and it doesn't matter, then why bother fighting sin? If you say that and mean it, and go on acting on it, you're probably not born again and should tremble. But that is not where most of you are. Most of you want to fight sinful patterns in your life. And you want God, what, and what God is saying to you is this, let Christ's covering of your failures, failures give you hope to fight. I write this to you that you might not sin. If you sin, you have an advocate in Jesus Christ. Gift number three. Christ will help us. Finally, the third implication of the double truth that Christ came to destroy our sin and to forgive our sin is this. Christ will help us in our fight. He really will help you. He is on your side. He didn't come to destroy sin because sin is fun. He came to destroy sin because sin is fatal. It is a deceptive work of the devil. And it will destroy us if we don't fight it. He came to help us not hurt us. So here's your third Christmas present. Christ will help overcome sin in you. 1 John 4.4 4 says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Jesus is alive. Jesus is almighty. Jesus lives in us by faith. And Jesus is for us, not against, is for us, not against us. He will help you in your fight with sin. And in the new year, trust him. What a great reminder, these great three presents of what Christ has done for you. And these are gifts that we should open up and should be reminded that what we have. That the first gift of a clear purpose for living. A clear purpose of living that we are to not sin and to repent of sin and to live a life that is um, 
gives glory to God, that is obedient to Father, that is holy, righteous life. What a beautiful gift that He has now given to us, the ability to fight sin. He has given you that ability. He has given us uh, a second gift that, uh, um, of, uh, and I should say also, I should say that first gift that He is to, to love us, Jesus, to love God, to love others, to believe in Jesus, and to love others. The, uh, that is our purpose. Our purpose is live for Christ. Gift two is a hope that our failures will be forgiven. And that uh, you will fail. That It happens. It, there isn't a question where you fail. It's not a question where you sin. The question, but what it is saying is that when you do sin, Christ will forgive you. If you truly have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you do sin, Christ will forgive you. And you turn and repent of your sins, and Christ will forgive you. He is your advocate that we can trust. And so we do not uh, become discouraged that we sin again, but we say, God, forgive me for sin again. Help me be stronger for next time. Um, and then the, the reminder of the third gift that Christ will help us. And Christ does help us. He encourages us. He empowers us. He strengthens us. Through his Holy Spirit, he enables you to fight that good fight. And so we have a purpose. We have a, 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 uh, we have a purpose. We have forgiveness. And we have God empowers us to help us. These three gifts. And uh, before I finish, I want to go ahead and uh, just finish up, he has some concluding thoughts in his book, and I think it's worthwhile looking at. My favorite Christmas text. My favorite Christmas text puts humility at the heart of Christmas. So this Christmas, I'm marveling at Jesus' humility and wanting more of it myself. I quote the text in a moment. But first, there are two problems. Tim Carr helps us to see one of them when he says, Humility is so shy. If you began talking about it, it leaves. Hmm. So a humil uh, uh, so the meditation on humility, like this one, is a self-defeating, it seems. But even shy people peek out sometimes if they are treated well. <laughs> the other problem is that Jesus wasn't humble for the same reason we are, or should be. So how can looking at Jesus' Christmas uh, hum uh, humility help us. Our humility, if there is any at all, is based on our finiteness, our fallibility, and our sinfulness. But the eternal Son of God was not finite. He was not fallible. And he was not sinful. So unlike our humility, Jesus' humility originated some other way. Here's my favorite Christmas text. Look for Jesus' humility. In Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. What defines Jesus' humility is the fact that it is mainly a conscious act of putting himself in a lowly servant role for the good of others. Humility is defined by such phases as he emptied himself of the divine right to be free from abuse and suffering. He took the form of a servant. He became a being to a point of death, even death on a cross. So though Jesus' humility was not a heart disposition of being finite or fallible or sinful. It was a heart of infinite perfection and infallible truthfulness and freedom from all sin that for which very reason did not need to be served. He was free and full, overflowing in serving. Another Christmas text says this in Mark 10, 45. 
The Son of God came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus' humility was not a sense of defect in himself, but a sense of fullness in himself. Put at, uh, at the disposal of others for their good. It was a voluntary lowering of himself to make the height of his glory available for sinners to enjoy. Jesus makes a connection between Christmas loneliness and the goodness for us. Come to me, O who labor are very, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take upon my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart. You will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 His loneliness makes our rel relief from the burdens possible. If he were not lowly, he would not have been obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And if he had not been obedient to die for us, he would not be crushed under the weight of our sins. The lower himself to take our condemnation. Romans 8, 3. Now we have, have more reason to be humble than before. We're in, finite, viable, and sinful, and therefore have no ground for boasting at all. But now we see other humbling things. Our salvation is not owning to our work, but his grace. So boasting is excluded, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. And the way he accomplished that gracious salvation was through a volunteer, conscious, self-lowering, and a servant-like obedience to the point of death. So in addition to a finiteness, viability, and sinfulness, we now have two other huge impulses at work. To humble us free and undeserving grace under, under earth all our blessings and a model of self-denial, sacrifice, servanthood that willing to take the form of a servant. So we are called to join Jesus in this conscious self-humbling and servanthood. Whoever exalts himself will be humble, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Matthew 23, 12. Have this in mind among yourself, which is your is yourself in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 5. Let's pray that this shining virtue, this massive ground, our salvation, our servanthood, would peek out from our quiet place and grant us the garments of loneliness this Advent. Clothe yourself, all, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5, 5. And this is truly true. We are at this time of, we need to remember these wonderful gifts and these gifts of what Christ has done for us. And they humble us. And if Jesus Christ can humble himself and come down from glory from heaven, be incarnate in a baby and be born in a manger, God incarnate, he took on the position of a servant. He humbled himself. That he had to come down for us. What, what a humbling thing. And may we be humbled this Christmas of what Christ did. He did the thing we could not do. He defeated sin and death. He came so we can have peace with God. So we can have joy with God. So we can have love God and love others. That we be changed and transformed and renewed in this little baby. And that we may have peace with God and with each other. May this Christmas season truly be a blessing. And I just want to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. And I pray that this Advent devotion has blessed your heart and soul as it has done mine. God bless you and have a great Christmas.